Um, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Pull it away a little bit. Is that better? Pull it down. Down. Good. Can you guys still hear me? Good. Okay. Um, no, thank you guys for coming out. Um, I wanted to take a minute to tell you a little bit about Public House Brewing Company. Um, we were founded in Rolla, Missouri in 2010. Uh, we opened our doors uh, the 16th of December. Um, we had a small brew pub right in the middle of downtown. Is anybody familiar with the brand at all? Oh. Ah, oh, my people are back there. How you doing, people? Um, so we started off with a kind of a brew pub concept uh, without a restaurant. Um, everything that we were doing was focusing on the beer. Um, and kind of our slant and what we were taking and focusing on was session style, uh, which is now becoming very popular. We're seeing a lot more session IPAs especially, but uh, the session lower gravity beers that are becoming very popular the last couple of years. And that was kind of our niche and what we started with. Um, from there, uh, we opened the 16th of December. Uh, we have a small three and a half barrel brewery in Rolla, which means that we produce about 100, a little bit over 100 gallons of beer each batch that we produce. Um, I remember giving a tour that first weekend and uh, one of the guys raised his hand and he said, uh, how much, how long would it take us to, to, to empty the place out, to drink all the beer that you have here? And I said, oh, don't worry about it. We've got plenty. Uh, seven days later, we were completely out of beer. So I'll never make that mistake again. Um, and it's been very, very well received within the community um, and in the, the, the area surrounding Rolla. We're kind of in a, in a waste zone out there. There's not a lot of breweries. And at the time when we opened, um, you know, the closest breweries, you had to come to St. Louis, you had to drive down to Springfield, um, Columbia, uh, Kansas City. And that's still pretty much the case. I mean, we've got uh, our friends up at, uh, in Jeff City at Prison Brews, and then we've got Piney River Brewing Company that opened up about an hour south of us. But we're still kind of uh, the island out there uh, in otherwise a beer barren wasteland. So um, I think that's helped with our success. Um, uh, within the first uh, two years of opening up, um, we were submitting our beers to competition. Within the first nine months, we picked up a bronze medal at the Great American Beer Festival. Um, and then again, two months later, we picked up um, another bronze medal at the World Beer Cup um, and continue um, to submit beers to competitions um, and continue to, to try and bring home medals. Um, the first beer that we're tasting tonight, Rod Scream Ale, just actually picked up a gold medal at the Best of Craft Beer out in Portland, uh, Oregon. So we're pretty happy um, with the products that we've been pushing out. Um, and the response has been very, very, very good. So a couple of years ago, we got to the point where we had really maxed out, two years into operation, where we'd maxed out the capacity of the brew house. Um, so what we started doing is we started looking at what our options were going to be, whether it was going to be to try to expand within the existing space that we had, try to buy out a neighbor, um, uh, where we're going to go and look to put up a new building outside of town somewhere and just have a production facility so that we can start distribution? Uh, are we going to go try and find, uh, go the contract brewery route? Looking at a lot of different options, uh, we were very fortunate. There is a large winery uh, eight miles down the road from us, St. James Winery, um, uh, largest winery in the state. Um, one of their owners was in, there. They, they frequent our place quite a bit. They came to us and said, hey, we, you know, someday we'd like to sit down and talk to you about beer. Uh, we, you know, we want to see if there's an opportunity there. It's something that they wanted to, they've been looking at get, trying to get into for the last three or four years and were really uh, impressed by what we were doing. So we called them up one day, we sat down and we said, so what do you want to talk about? And uh, they were wanting to open a brewery and they were looking for somebody to partner with. They wanted to try and find somebody that shared in the passion for beer, what they have in wine, uh, the the quality of the products uh, being number one. So we sat down uh, over the next six months or so and had like a nice little courtship where we just drank a lot of wine, drank a lot of beer, and <laughs> talked about what the next step might look like. Um, fortunately, at the end of all that, uh, we woke up a little, you know, worse for wear, uh, and decided that it would be a good partnership. That the the two businesses work really well together. So we were very happy to bring them on. Um, they came on board with Public House Brewing Company a little over a year ago. Uh, we broke ground on our new facility in 
uh, February of 2014, and we opened our doors to our new product facility in November of 2014. Uh, so a very quick turnaround. Our second facility is located in St. James, Missouri, which is about eight miles down the road from our uh, original location. The original location is still there. Um, we're still brewing beer there. We're turning that into more of an R&D pilot brewery. So the idea is that uh, as we come up with new ingredients and techniques, um, things that we want to try, we can do that in the Rollo location, kind of build up the recipes. Um, we have a great built-in tasting panel there. We've got a lot of people that like to try stuff, give very good constructive feedback, uh, whether they like it or they don't. Uh, and then that gives us an opportunity when we see stuff that works well there to move it out to our production facility in St. James to scale up the recipes and look at distribution of those. So we just started our launch um, with major brands uh, last week. So we're just now getting into the St. Louis market. Um, so you should start seeing us on stores. I don't know where yet. I just make the donuts. Somebody else is selling them. Um, so it, it, it's out and about. Um, I'll, I'm sure I'll get better at that. But we launched with uh, four products, which we're going to be you know, running through and tasting tonight. Um, and we're going to start off this, this evening with the cream ale, moving into our Hefeweizen. We've got the uh, IPA that we brought up and our stout. So we've got quite a wide range of beers that we're going to be uh, t uh, testing out tonight and tasting. And I'm just going to walk you through it. If you guys have any questions at any point while I'm talking, just keep it going. Yes? The question was who had seen the product on the shelves yet? Um, we've been around for a while, we've, um, and that's, that's something I think that's been kind of good for us as we launched this product. Uh, we've done a lot of festivals around the states over the last five years. Even though we didn't distribute, it was, you know, we want to go have fun too. So uh, we'd always cart our stuff around. We've been to um, a lot of festivals up here in the St. Louis area, Columbia, Springfield, Kansas City. So it might have been something that you'd, you'd seen or, or tasted um, at some point. And I know those festivals get a little hairy sometimes. And, you don't remember everything. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Josh Stacy. I'm one of the co-founders of Public House Brewing Company. Started with um, a friend of mine, Josh Goodridge. So we make it really easy. It's just one of the Joshes. And uh, if you're mad, then it's his fault. And if you're happy, it's my fault. So that's kind of how we keep things even over there. Um, so I grew up um, in, in a beer household. Um, I was, I guess, one of the fortunate kids. My dad was an amateur brewer, has been an amateur brewer for over 30 years. So uh, when I was a young, young, young child, um, and I would wake up on the weekends, and I, you know, like every little kid, wanted to get up, and run downstairs, and turn on the TV and start watching cartoons, um, I had chores that I had to do. I had to either, you know, mill grain or help bottle beer, uh, all these really, really arduous, horrible things. Um, so it was something that I was exposed to my entire life, and I, was, I grew up around it. Um, you know, all the beer that we had in our house growing up was made in-house. Um, so everything that we did, we, we bottled and kegged everything. Everything that we had on tap, anything that we were serving was made in-house. Um, and so I guess it was just something that I thought everyone did. I thought everyone made their own beer. Um, you know, and it wasn't probably until I was about 14 or 15 that I realized that most people just go to the store, which is a hell of a lot easier. Um, so, you know, grew up in Rolla, Missouri, went to school in Rolla, uh, left after high school, um, went away, you know, did the young, young guy thing. Um, when I moved back to Rolla, um, work brought me back there just a few years later, and the, my partner, Josh, and I uh, were trying to make it as rock and roll stars. We wanted to be in a rock band, um, and we'd grow, grown up playing music together, and uh, about, we had a good three-year run. Um, and then it just all fizzled away and, you know, nothing ever came of it, you know. So you can cry me a river later. Um, but because of that, we had a lot of free time on our hands. And so I, we, we, we're back in Rolla. Our weekends are now free. We're not out trying to, you know, start a musical revolution. So the next best thing that I could offer him was to teach him how to make beer. So he started coming over to my house and just like a lot of um, sitting in the garage, brewing up beer, talking about beer, talking about how great 
we lo you know how we love these products, how we wish that there was more available uh, in the area, um, and how we really felt that Rolla was kind of ripe for the picking. Um, the community itself is surrounded. It's a lot of uh, kind of more white collar. We've got the, the university engineer school down there. We've got Fort Leonard Wood, which is within 20 miles. Um, but there's not, there wasn't a lot of outlet. And this was a conversation that also went on throughout my entire life. You know, my dad wanted to start that first brew pub and get it going. And unfortunately, you know, life gets in the way, kids, work, responsibility. Um, I, on the other hand, started these conversations when I was young and dumb enough to try and give it a shot. So um, about a, a year and a half of Josh coming over every weekend and working on recipes and just kind of having fun and playing around with it, um, he, he posed a question to me and he said, hey, you know, are you going to stop talking about this or do you want to try and actually do something about it? Um, so we went with the latter. Well, we talked to our wives first. Always have to get the wives' permission. Um, so we sat down and asked the wives if they would, you know, go through this process with us and, and just kind of humor us to see if this thing would work out. Um, and it took us about three years from the time that we decided that we wanted to do it before we opened our doors. Um, and I'm very happy to say that it's been a wild ride ever since. And uh, we've had a lot of fun and we hope to continue to have a lot of fun. So now I got my beer. This means we get a drink now, which is what everyone really wants to do, right? So this is, uh, this is the cream ale. Um, this beer is a year-round beer for us. We've had this beer on tap um, probably about within the first year that we opened. This was one of the beers that we brought out. Um, and this beer was a replacement for another kind of core beer that we had. So when we launched Public House in Rolla, we had a, a Kolsch that we did. Um, similar, um, but different. And we really liked the Kolsch, and the Kolsch was very well received. Um, it, the, one of the issues when you're brewing Kolsch is it's a very, very sensitive, very, very delicate beer. Um, and there's really no room to hide any kind of flaw. Um, and we have horrible water in Rolla. So that stuff shines through a lot. Uh, there, are, there are things that we can do, and we do treat the water, and we, we clean the water there. But um, unfortunately, uh, to turn around the beer very quickly, um, it, it just we weren't, we weren't really liking uh, what we were getting out of it. So the Kolsch was a beer that was taking us a little bit longer, four to five weeks, and we were really needing something that we could turn around every two weeks. So the Kolsch kind of, you know, every, even though everyone loved it, um, we weren't really happy with the consistency that we were getting out of it. We dumped about 10% of the Kolsch that we made in the first year, uh, just because we weren't happy with how it, how it tasted um, before we put it out. Um, and we continue, if, you know, that's kind of our motto. If we don't like it, um, if it doesn't pass, um, you know, our standards, then it doesn't go out. It doesn't go anywhere. It never sees the light of day. Home brewers hate me, and they love me, but when they come in and they see the bottom of the tank open and all the beer flowing out, um, they kind of cry a little bit. <laughs> I got to hug them and give them a beer and tell them it's going to be okay. So what we were doing is we were trying to find a replacement. We wanted a beer that was similar, very approachable in the market. Um, we wanted something, because we are in the kind of rural Midwest, we knew that there wasn't a lot of uh, varieties out there. A lot of people hadn't, the craft beer movement was just starting to pick up again, and there wasn't a lot available on the store shelves. So we wanted to try and find something that was uh, approachable, kind of looked the part of what a lot of people were used to drinking, um, but we still wanted to, you know, make it our own and, and, and have fun with it. So, Rod's Cream Ale. Anyone want to guess where the name Rod came from? Uh, he's, he's, yeah. My dad? No, actually, um, it's a guy we hired. And um, he's, our, he's uh, an assistant brewer with us, um, and he's a fantastic home brewer. Um, he's been doing it for a very, very long time. And when he came on uh, to work at Public House, one of the contingencies was that he brought this recipe with him. So, you know, if you can't figure stuff out, find somebody and hire them and have them bring their recipe over. It's worked out well for us. Um, so this is something that he brought over. Um, and again, this is going to look the part and kind of taste the part of a, a light American lager. So we want something, um, you know, very kind of crisp and clean on the finish um, and really dry. So we do that uh, in the brewing process by using a small amount of adjunct. So we do use corn in cream ale, which is very traditional for the style, but we do quite a bit less than what you would find traditionally. If you go back historically and look at cream ale, um, corn is used up to about 20% of the grain bill 
um, we use uh, just under 5% in ours. So it's just enough to be there and to be kind of recognized in the back, uh, in the aroma and in the palate, but not so up front and in your face. Um, we do hop this beer um, with some more traditional German style hops. So we use Hersbrucker Hallertauer is the hop variety that we use. And we don't use that much. Uh, again, we're really just trying to have a nice balance um, where you know nothing, no one true ingredient is kind of standing out, taking all the attention. Uh, we wanted something that was pretty even, um, very crisp, clean, uh, and a dry finish to it. Um, not gonna try, just, I need to drink, sorry guys. Um, so like I said, this beer, uh, we just sent out to um, the Best of Craft Beer competition up in Portland and uh, took a gold medal with it. Um, and we were very happy about that. This is a beer that's been really hard for us to place in the competition categories because it kind of rides the line. Um, if you um, go back and look at where Cream Ale came from, Cream Ale was the response to um, the, in the north uh, east part of the country when you had all of the German immigration coming in and they were bringing over their lagers, this was kind of the answer to that. So everyone was getting really excited about light lagers and it was kind of turning people away from the ale houses that were popular in the Northeast. And so they wanted something to kind of compete with it. And they said, well, we can do the same thing, um, but we'll make an ale version of it. And so um, one thing that you see in this, and I had, had, have had this question asked quite a bit over the last couple of weeks as we've been out and around, is you know what type of ale and what our fermentation practices are with this. Um, we do use ale yeast. Um, there are some breweries out there that will use a lager yeast, um, but we, we find that just by bringing the fermentation temperature down quite a bit, um, we can still get a really nice, clean, lager-like finish without having um, to have this thing sit for four to five weeks. Um, so, popular styles. Has anybody had cream ale before? Anybody really familiar with the brand? Yeah, I've got some folks in that. Genesee fans in here? Little Kings? Yeah, that's the big one. Everyone remembers that from back in the day. Um, so this is, this is similar, but the big difference that you're going to find between this and some of the older brands, again, goes back to the, the adjunct usage and that we're using such a smaller amount of adjunct. We started off pretty high, but over the years, we've just been breaking it, pulling it back and pulling it back and pulling it back. Um, we still want that presence there, but um, you know we don't want it to be overbearing. Some other styles, um, it, it's it's kind of an interesting beer too, and in that in the craft kind of beer wave that we've been having, uh, you don't see a lot of breweries that are doing it. I'm starting to see a few more that are starting to to look at the cream ale as an option. Um, you know, we we see some Kolsch out there, um, and I think people are starting to kind of get back into some of the more light lager styles and these hybrid beers. Uh, so I think you'll start seeing some more of these. Uh, you know, one of our favorite uh, renditions of this is um, New Glarus has a beer called Spotted Cow. Has anyone had that Spotted Cow? Yeah, good beer, huh? Anything New Glarus does is great, though. We love those guys. Um, do you guys have any questions in particular on the cream ale? Um, not this particular one, but no, I mean, really what it was is it was, it, it was the ale houses trying to make a lager without lagering it. Um, and the, and the, you know, the name cream ale, it was more descriptive of the mouthfeel. Um, and a lot of that does still come from the adjunct usage and then the carbonation level. So we do carbonate this beer just a little bit higher, um, than we would most of the ales that we do. Um, but yeah, it's just, I mean, Distinctive cream ale should just be nice, clean, great, American-made lawnmower beer. Any other questions on the cream ale? All right. I guess this means we get to drink the next beer, huh? Okay. So everyone's got the second beer that we brought up, which is our hide and seek Hefeweizen. So this is a traditional German-style uh, Hefeweizen. So this is our, our wheat beer. Um, so this... This beer, kind of, if we go back and we look at the, the story of where this beer came from, this again, this wasn't in our original lineup when we opened the place in Rolla. Uh, we, we had been brewing this beer, um, but we didn't really want to jump out of the gate with the Hefeweizen. 
Uh, there's a brewery up in Kansas City, if you guys have heard of, called Boulevard. They've got a beer called uh, Unfiltered Wheat, and it's, it, it's done very well for them. Um, and it kind of saturates our market uh, down in Rolla, where we're at. And at the time, that was about the only thing on craft that you could get. Uh, if you went out to a bar or restaurant in the, in the greater Rolla area, you were kind of sitting with Boulevard Wheat. So we, what we knew, this is like not anywhere near Boulevard Wheat. Um, great beer, but not that beer. Um, we, the process that we use, the ingredients and the techniques that we use are more traditional to the German style of brewing and the German style wheat beers. Um, and we knew that if we put that out there, we thought there might be a lot of confusion of people like, well, that's not wheat beer. That's not, oh no, that doesn't taste like, you know, the wheat beer that I, I know. So we, we held off. We didn't, we didn't launch with that product. We waited, and this was actually the first seasonal that we brought out. So we brought this beer out about six months after we opened. It was our first uh, spring seasonal, um, and we have not been allowed by our patrons to take it off. So every time we, we take it off or we run out, I get in a lot of trouble. So um, we're pretty excited about this beer. Um, from the appearance side of it, um, we don't do any uh, filtration or findings on this. This has cleared out a little bit as it will in the bottle. Um, we, if you get the bottle, um, the sediment you'll see is still in there. A lot of people like to shake that up and dump it back in. Um, but we don't do any kind of finding or filtration on this beer. Um, if you start with the aromatics of it, um, you're going to get uh, a lot going on with this beer. Um, there's a lot of phenol, what we call phenols and esters that are prevalent in this beer. Um, the phenols represent clove in this case. So as you smell it and you start picking up a lot of that spicy clove type characteristic, and then the esters that we're coaxing out during fermentation uh, lend to more of the banana fruitiness that we get in there. Uh, these are both two very traditional um, aromatics and flavors that you'll get in German style Hefeweizen. Um, and in order to do that, we use a different yeast strain in the brew house. So um, this is a, a different type of ale yeast, a German specific to German style wheat beers. Um, but the other thing that we have to do to really coax those flavors out is our fermentation temperatures. We ferment this beer relatively hot um, on the hot side for ales. So we'll hold temperature on this at about 76 degrees versus when we do most of our other beers where we're holding it between 65 and 67. So by just raising that temperature, about 10 degrees, um, we're able to coax out all of these different flavors. So no bananas were harmed in the making of this beer, um, I promise. Um, and we don't add any clove. I mean, it's still just the basic ingredients. We, it's 50% wheat. Um, we do have a little bit of crystal malt that we throw in, carminic malt, German malt that we throw in uh, to color it up and give it that nice orange color. Um, water, hops, and this yeast strain. That's all it is. Um, but it's, it's been really fun to uh, share this beer with people um, as there is such a big complex uh, depth of flavor in it that is amazing that you can get out of it, but just by changing a few ingredients and doing a few key things in the brewing process. Um, one of the other things that we do in the brewing process that's a little bit more traditional is in, um, when we do the mashing of the grain, instead of just doing what we call a, a single infusion mash, which is just one temperature throughout, we do uh, a step infusion mash. So we actually are starting at a very low temperature and we're rising ever so slightly throughout the process. Um, and that kind of really just, it's a, it's a German technique. And um, I remember when I came in and we were talking with the brewers and we were gonna make this beer. Um, and I came in, I said, okay, we're doing it and we're gonna do this step infusion mash and we're going to do four steps and it's going to take three hours and they looked at me and they said shut up we're not doing it and they got pretty upset with me because um, they didn't want to do it i mean that that it just added like two hours to their day because i wanted to be a purist um, but in, in the long run they, they went through they did it um, they brewed it once and they said man i don't want to do that again they brewed it twice and by the third time they brewed it we don't brew it any other way now and they wouldn't brew it any other way um, and there are reasons technical reasons why we do that. Um, it really helps with uh, later on in the fermentation side of the thing. So I, I'd be happy to talk with anybody about that later. Um, I'm trying not to get too geeky, but if I need to get more geeky, let me know, okay? Um, so the, like I said, the Hefeweizen was our first seasonal that um, we brought out and it now has become a, a core lineup for us. Um, we have a fairly large 
German contingency in the greater Rolla area, mainly due to the university um, and to uh, the hospital in Fort Leonard Wood being right there. We get a lot of soldiers that come in for educational purposes. So we have a fairly large German contingency. Um, and I would say for me, that was the biggest compliments that we get is when we get the folks that know this style and are familiar with this style and drink it all the time at home and they come over here um, and they're very, very happy with the product that, that we're putting out and it reminds them of home and it's, it's just um, very familiar to them. So that's the biggest compliment for me um, in knowing that we did the right thing with this beer. Um, anybody have any questions on Hefeweizen? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the ABV we is a little bit, we're about 4.7%. Um, IBUs come in right at 14, 15. Uh, same on the cream ale, we're at about 5.2% ABV, and IBUs are sitting there at 16, 17. Okay. I'm trying to think if there's any funny stories about the heck. I don't know if there is. Yes. So the question was, does the tree um, on our logo symbolize anything? Um, it, <laughs> it does. Um, it is kind of representative of the tree of life. Um, so when we open uh, Public House in Rolla, um, one of the things that we wanted to do is really kind of focus on the community and um, trying to make that an, as authentic of a European public house as we could. Um, so we, you know, we don't have TVs, we don't have any kind of technical distractions. Um, I mean, the idea is for people to come there and it's just a, a meeting place and it's a social gathering place. Um, and it's been very well received at first. I know when we open, so the symbolism, before I get off track, the symbolism is to, you know, the whole familial and community aspect of, of the tree. And, and we thought that it fit very well with our vision for what we wanted with our establishment. Um, so the funny thing about, you know, the, the pub and when we were opening it is that everyone told us that we were just, it wasn't going to work, you know, how can you not have TVs in your bar and how can you not have food and it's just never going to work. And I said, well, I don't know anything about being a restaurant guy and I don't need to watch TV all the time. So that's, and we stuck to it and it was pretty, we stuck to our guns on that. Um, and it was very interesting because after a very, very short time of being open, uh, we probably got more compliments on, on not having those things. Um, than we did on and all the people that were telling us you know, that it would never work without it. Um, so I think it's time for the next one, the IPA. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, back here. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we have a lot. Uh, we've got books and um, a lot of board games and cards, and people are encouraged to bring anything in. As far as the food goes, we do. You know, you can bring your own food in. We work with some uh, restaurants that are very close to us, and we keep their menus, and they'll actually, you can call them up, and they'll deliver to your table. I mean, we just kind of worked out relationships with them. So it keeps us from having to run a restaurant, but it still keeps people if they want food. Um, you know, we, we encourage them to do that. Um, so now it's time for the IPA. Anybody here IPA drinkers? Okay, a few of us, yeah. So. IPA is the top selling brand of beer for craft brewers across the board, anywhere you go in the United States, any brewery you go into, um, everyone has got an IPA, well, not every brewery, but most of them have an IPA. Uh, very, very popular style, which is kind of funny to me. Um, when you look at what it is, 
Um, I often compare it to like the big bold red wine. You know, it's that it's that what that is to the Cabernet Franc or the Cabernet is in the wine world. This is in the beer world. Um, it's definitely the the beer that takes for a lot of people the longest time to acquire, um, and a lot of that just has to do with the uh, over abundance of bitterness that we get from the hops. Um, you know, instinctively things that are bitter are not good for us. You know, if you're out in the woods and you start eating stuff and it's bitter, you kind of spit it out and you go on to the next plant. Um, so it's kind of interesting to me that so many people get an acquired taste to uh, IPAs, Imperial IPAs, Double IPAs, Quadruple IPAs. It's kind of gotten crazy um, over the years. Um, when we opened up, we didn't have an IPA. Um, we did have a, a, a pale ale, an American pale ale, uh, but no IPA. And the pale ale did very well for us, and it was one of those things where we brought an IPA out as a seasonal, and again, the patrons would not let us take it off. So uh, it took a couple years uh, before we were um, doing it on a regular basis. Probably our second year, uh, we were in full swing with the IPA and uh, kind of pulled the APA back and did it more seasonally. So we kind of flipped those roles, which is kind of interesting for me too, because the ape pale ales are usually a little bit more introductory. Um, but it's been fun over the years at, when we look at our brewery, how much the palate in the community has changed. Um, from when we first opened up, um, the cream ale is still our number one seller, um, but the other three are, it's like a, such a close tie for second, and there's not a big gap between first and second. So everything kind of sells pretty evenly, but it's just been fun to see the evolution of the palate over the past five years. We kind of got a nice controlled environment to look at that in. So, public house IPA. Um, I could spend, I don't know, the rest of the day talking about this beer. Uh, labor of love, um, pain in my ass, and um, at the end of the day, um, this is the second IPA that we've released. Um, so if you ever went down to the pub in Rala, Two, over a year and a half, two years ago, this wasn't even on the menu. We had a tire swing IPA, was the IPA that we were serving down there. Uh, the tire swing IPA was pretty straightforward. We were using Centennial and Cascade, um, Pale Ale malt, a little bit of crystal, and that was it. It's kind of the same, same ingredients that everyone's using in IPAs, um, especially for their first IPA or the, uh, if they have a series of IPAs, everyone's got that kind of C hop IPA, a uh, little bit of crystal, just add water and go. Um, so just like everybody else, when we opened in 2010, taking a step back, where there were only about, there were just at 1,600 breweries operating in the United States. So in this past five years, we've reached over 3,000 breweries operating in the United States. And that means we've doubled the amount of guys that want the same hops to put into the beer that the the other guys, what we were making five years ago. So uh, hop varieties are becoming uh, a lot harder uh, if you're not contracting out and you're not locking in and getting to know your farmers. So um, it's kind of a supply and demand kind of thing. So we started seeing the trend and we started seeing that everyone was using the same hops and the hops were getting harder and harder and harder to find. Um, and you know, just harder to get on contract even two, three, four years out. So what we, I sat down with my brewers, I said, you know, there's a lot of other hop varieties out there, um, and I'm curious um, if all these other hops that are out there that no one really ever pays attention to, if there's kind of a diamond in the rough, if there's something out there that, that no one knows about. And um, kind of naive, wishful thinking, I think. But what we did do is we went to our broker and we kind of looked at what was available throughout the year that was always available um, and took the varieties that we most of, most of the varieties we picked were varieties that we weren't familiar with. And we went through a fairly long and arduous process of trying to see if we could find um, one hop in particular um, that we might be able to use to reinvent our IPA. So we started off with about 12 different varieties and we started off very simple. I mean, the bags came in, we opened them up and we stuck our nose in there, um, smelled them. And there were some that even right away um, we liked but we knew that it wasn't going to fit the profile of what we were aiming for, for the aromatics and the flavor that we wanted. Um, I think we were able to eliminate maybe two right off the bat. Um, we did save them and use them in some other beers. The second thing that we did after that is we started doing some steeping. So uh, we just basically took the hops and 
hot water and made tea just to see what would happen to the aromatics of the hops as heat was introduced. Um, and we were able to kind of whittle away a little bit more. Um, and this, you know, and then we started kind of playing around with flavor profile, just doing some tasting of it. Uh, but really, when we got down to it, we had about uh, six, six different varieties that we wanted to kind of take to the next level, which was to actually start brewing with them. Um, so one day, the two brewer, the other two brewers and I, um, we made nine IPAs. Uh, it was fun. It was a lot of beer making. Uh, and what we did is we did, we did it very simple. We did smash brewing. So we just had one malt that we used and we just used one hop. And we used that hop in each of the hop additions that we did throughout the boil. So we used it for our bittering, our flavor, and our, and our aromatics. Because we wanted to see what each variety had to offer in each of those categories. Um, so now we have, you know, uh, all these IPAs that we've got to go through and, and, and kind of taste. Right? Rambling? Yeah. Um, so we went through the process, we, we brewed all these, and then we started, you know, tasting them. And really, we didn't find anything that just, you know, blew our hair back and, and got us really excited. But it, as far as a hop that really contributed to all of those, the bittering, the flavor, and the ar aromatics. But what we did find is we found some that we liked the way they smelled, hated the way they tasted. We found some that we liked, you know, the bitter qualities that they had, but didn't like the flavor. We found some that we really liked the flavor, um, hated the bitterness and the aromatics. I mean, we just, we, so we went through and we kind of picked and chose all of these different attributes from each of these different um, IPAs that we made. And then we started blending them. Um, and we went through a long, arduous blending process to see if we could find good combinations. And what we ended up with is we ended up using six different varieties of hops in the Elusive IPA. Some of them are traditional and classic. So there is just a touch of Cascade that we put in there. Um, but I think it makes up less than like 2% of the hop bill. Um, we were using Autonum, uh, Millennium, uh, Crystal, Faulkner's Flight, uh, uh, and Centennial type are the other five that we use in there. And we're using different combinations throughout the whole process. Um, we're pretty happy with the result. Um, so it, in the aromatics of it, um, you get a lot of that kind of citrusy grapefruit tangerine that's gonna come out. Um, and, you know, the appearance is fairly similar, but we did change the malt bill. While we were messing around with the hops, we said, yeah, why don't we just go through and change the malt bill? So what we did, the big thing that we did with the malt is we cut out all the crystal malt, which is what gives, um, has anyone had an old IPA before? Like an IPA that's just been sitting around for a long time, and it's kind of lost its pop, and it's just all sweet carameliness. Um, so we didn't, we didn't really like that um, attribute, and... Um, so what we did is we took all the malts that really, that really lend that self and, and come out later in the beer, and we took that stuff out. Um, so we pretty much have it down to just uh, a, a straight base malt, um, which I see a lot of breweries going to. Um, I've seen some from New Belgium that um, are that way. I've seen some from you know, even here in the area Boulevard and things like that, where we're kind of cutting back on that crystal malt and kind of cutting down on the carameliness. So we went ahead and did that. Uh, we still have a little bit of color that we get in there. Um, we get that from malts that add color but really don't add any of those flavor characteristics. Um, and then, like I said, six different varieties, dry hop the holy living hell out of it uh, and put it in a bottle. Um, the bitterness side of it, um, we're, we're coming in um, right at uh, 70 IBUs. But in my taste palette, it's a very smooth, easily approachable 70 IBUs. And the finish on it is not a, a whole lot lingering. It's not that tight bitterness that just hangs around for a long time. Um, again, we're, we're session-oriented brewers, and even though this beer comes in at 6.7%, uh, we still want it, which is a little bit high on the alcohol side for us, uh, we still wanted to make sure that it was approachable and it was something that you, know, you could just keep drinking and drinking and drinking. And in order to combat that, that's kind of why um, we spent so much time on that hop profile. I yawned on a lot about IPA. You can keep going if you want. Any, any questions on the IPA? Okay. All right, last beer. The Revelation Stout. Oh, everybody got the last beer? Okay. Um, Revelation Stout, um, when we were sitting in the garage 
so many years ago, seven or so years ago, and we were coming up with recipes and looking at beers that we wanted to make. Um, my partner, who was just kind of getting into the craft beer thing and getting into brewing, and I said, so what do you, what do you want the stout to look like? Do you have any kind of attributes that you want to throw out there? And he just said, make not Guinness. So this is not Guinness That's what we made. Um, so uh, what, again, what we're trying to do with this beer is make it a little bit more approachable. Um, and there a couple of things that um, with stouts that uh, a lot kind of, I think, tend to have people not really run to them is they, they have this kind of stigma that they're heavy. And when you drink them, you know, it's just that loaf of bread or that pork chop. I'm just going to sit in my belly and I'm just going to be done after one. Um, so in order to combat that, when we were designing this recipe, again, we wanted to be able to sit around and drink, you know, stout at the pub, you know, most of the night. So we didn't want to get weighed down. So what we did, uh, the first thing we did is we really just cut the body out. We cut the, the body out from underneath it. Um, and we did that by removing a lot of the face malt um, and, and any of the middle malts that would really kind of help build that, uh, that kind of heaviness that we get. Um, and then what we had to do is we kind of had to play a lot of balancing then with the roasted and chocolate malts that we used so it wasn't so overpowering because we kind of knocked the legs out from underneath it. Um, and lightly, uh, very lightly hopped, so you're not going to get um, a lot of hop in it. Really what we wanted to do is have the malt shine on this one. So aromatically what you're going to get is a lot of the dark chocolate. And as you drink it, you're going to get a lot more of the coffee flavors that are going to come out. Um, and again, it's just kind of a nice, super dry finish. Um, We've had kind of a hard time figuring out what kind of stout is it. Is it a dry stout? Is it an extra or an import? I don't know. I mean, we just kind of mess. It's, it's revelation stout. That's what it is. Um, so this, this beer, pretty straightforward. Um, this was our um, second win. So this uh, Tacoma Bronze at the World Beer Cup, um, our first go out. And we picked up a few more medals at the Best of Craft Beer with this. Um, and it's just, for us, it's been, it's been a lot of fun with this beer because as we went into the market, we really, you don't see a, a whole lot of stouts um, out on draft. And if you do, it's usually Guinness and, um, in, in our area. Um, and so what we were, we really weren't thinking that there was going to be too many people that were going to be out there wanting a stout. Um, and when we started giving this stuff out, as we were building the brand and we were building the business up and we were opening our doors and we were giving samples out, we sent some stuff out and we really got a huge positive response um, from everybody. Um, and we were really kind of shocked by that. Um, and for the first year and a half that we were open, our stout was our number two seller. Um, probably doesn't hurt that, you know, St. Pat's is very prevalent in Rolla and, you know, that whole Irish Catholic thing's going on down there. Um, and they, they really do enjoy their stout. But um, We've been really, really surprised by how many people that have come to us and said, you know, I don't like dark beer, I don't like stout, but I like this one. Um, and I think we've just kind of taken a lot of the stigmas out of stout in general. Yeah. Um, we don't do green beer.